Jane, can you, um, the title Anna? of this, the title of this exhibition is Dual Nature with Light, um, and that references um, a really important book that was just published about your career and your work. Um, can you talk a little bit about, here, I'll show the book for a second. So this is an extraordinary monograph that was published last year by Pointed Leaf Press. And if you all don't have it, um, just reach out to me and we'll get you a copy. Um, it's an incredible, incredible book that really shows the scope of Jane's work and how it's evolved over the years. Um, and, it, and this exhibition came out of the process of putting that book together. Jane, can you tell us about that? Yes, um, Susie, <clears throat> Suzanne Schlesin and Michael Steinberg, um, I spent from the time I was 23 um, learning about the art world from them and learning about life on the planet and being very close. And Susie said, it's time to do a book. Actually, Lucy Steinberg, her daughter said, it's time i to do a book because you've still got the pink nail polish on. Um, and so I think what happened with the book was that I could see perhaps for the first time the long trajectory of a life from the time that I was a teenager you're going to the Met and looking at the Egyptian Horus, which was the sun god, and um, he was a falcon, or she was a falcon. And it became an obsession for me to understand the nature of this sun god who was able to see both in and out kids would read Nancy Drew. I was reading Carl Hill Gibran. I had like a little spiritual problem. I, I was convinced that the story that God told was one that would allow us to see our nature through nature. And that's St. Saint, Saint Francis of Assisi there preaching to the birds. That's a goshawk. And I think from there, um, twofold is that Susie made me organize my life in, in sections and in bodies of work and how important it was I feel like saying like Meryl Streep I had a farm in Africa <laughs> you know it was like I was I, I was going to the country and I was teaching and I was trying to pass something on and I didn't know what and um stop me if I get lost then Daniela and I were given a grant to go to Portugal and work with the stone. And this is marble from Portugal that took 30 years to finish. And Daniela had a teacher and I had a friend and a teacher named Paul Reynard. And it reminded me of, of his presence and his posture. And year after year after year, I would carve this thing. And we spent six weeks in Portugal learning to carve stone. Jane, I'm sorry, can you tell it, when were you in Portugal? Do you remember what years that was? What year Daniela, that was? was that 88? Was it, I think it was 88. And this particular piece is stone from from that, that from the quarry there yeah. in Portugal. Yeah, wow. yeah. You no, know, uh, uh, the stone that you see that you have was started thirty years ago, um, and 
when we were outside, Daniela and I were working, we had never worked with stone. It was outside of a town called the Link Care. Um, they basically shot their lunch with arrows and put it over a grill. We didn't know what we were doing, although Daniela just really wanted to drive around on the tractor and pick up big pieces of stone. What um, is the title of this piece? It's called Marble Monk for Paul, and it's for Paul Reynard, who was a great artist and a great teacher. And um, I was writing him letters from Portugal. And Joao, the head engineer at the quarry at this place where we were given a grant, um, Daniela and I were trying to move these giant pieces of stone and stone is a hundred pounds per cubic foot. That's a lot. And Joao said in very broken English and I had no Portuguese, Jane, what it's the name the dog gives for the human being? And I said, I don't know Joao. The name the dog calls to the human being. And I said, I don't know, it's master. He said, ah, yes, Jane, the stone knows no master. And I think we both learned that and we learned to listen to the stone. And as a result, all this time I had been listening to the birds and um, listening to my students. How long were you a teacher, Jane? I'm still a teacher. Um, <laughs> I started teaching in 1978. Daniela was in my first classes. She came to me immediately, was my first assistant. Uh, Jean Siegel was the head of the School of Visual Arts at the time and wrote an article about me on my work called Polychrome Sculpture. And this was in New York? In New York, yeah. I'm a New Yorker. Yeah. I'm a New Yorker living with the birds. And, um, and I didn't know how to teach. And so she said, well, that doesn't really matter. And I thought, well, it, it does matter because these are giant, young, beautiful question marks. And if I can't pose their questions for them, with some love and intelligence, then I had no business teaching. So I went and studied and studied. And I studied with Robert Beverly Hale. I studied Renaissance drawing technique with John Brustowski at NYU. I studied what was then called Eastern art. Um, and I put together a way of teaching drawing. And I, I would teach at the, I taught at the School of Visual Arts. I think they still think I'm senior faculty. I don't, you know, New Yorkers are a trip. I don't think they noticed I had left yet. <laughs> um, but, because I left to teach, I was gonna go write the SVA drawing manual. Um, and I think teaching has given me my children, my art children. Yukali is one of my children, Daniela, um, Joshua, Stephan. I mean, I can, there, there are really hundreds of people. I think Lori Murphy signed up and she was in one of my first classes. I still remember all her drawings. <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, she has a gift she doesn't know she has. And it was this kind of odd paper cubist robe she drew herself in for her self portrait. And mm -hmm. I think that is the uh, thing that has taught me most, I must be telling the truth, my nose runs and my eyes tear when I tell the truth, um, or allergies too maybe, but... <laughs> um, What's the title of the piece we're looking at now? It's called Mirandy Tale. 
And I think that um, I got very involved with Giorgio Morandi because I had sort of become a hermit and he did these extraordinarily simple and complex still lives. And he lived with his two sisters in Italy. And during the time of war, he painted these beautiful still lives. Um, this is, this is Mirandi. Um, and we went, and I've seen quite a few. Can you see what I'm doing? Mm, can you hold it up? Probably a not, but. Can you hold it up a little uh, bit more, Jane? Yeah. Yeah. Up? Yeah. You know, you over my face. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Up over my face. <laughs> Just to see the picture for a minute. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. So um, he didn't allow his sisters to dust the vessels. And the compositions were. It was as if he was looking at the war through a way of composing another quality of life. Um, he had this great quote. Um, you see if I can easily find it. Um, So he would construct these uh, still lives in real and then paint them? And then paint them. And then he would change them ever so slightly and then draw around this table they were on with these circles, you know, like to mark where they were. And he wrote that um, one could travel this world and see nothing. To achieve understanding, it is necessary not to see many things, but to look hard at what you do see. And I decided I wanted to make three-dimensional Mirandis and that I missed the city, but I knew that I needed to be here and tell the story of the birds. Jane, um, can you tell and us? Of nature. Um, so, so you you lived and worked in New York City for my well, whole and, life. Yeah, for well, and then yeah, you moved. Well, how did you end up in Northern California? Um, the School of Visual Arts gave me a sabbatical to write um, a book called the a School of Visual Arts How to Draw Manual. And so I came out here for six months and I was outside on the back deck at this horse ranch I was renting, the house, the house of, and there was a red-tailed hawk. And I, I, I dream, I've always dreamt that I was a hawk and I would fly. I'd only get like about four feet off the ground. Like I can remember <laughs> flying through Tiffany's with my mother and she was looking at the counters and I was flying low over the counters. So, and I had a duck when I was a baby called Silly the Duck um, that I slept with. I, I don't know why, but you know, it was as if I was given that gift. Um, birds have would, always been, even when you were in New York, birds were always, very much a feature always, in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I used to sit out on the fire escape with the birds um, and we had peregrine falcons. Hmm. But, and on Oak Island where I, I went, well, let me finish this. So I'm outside on the deck and this red tailed hawk flies over my head and he circles me. And I hear a voice plain as day saying, stay here, tell my story. And I like looking around like, what is, you know, what is this? And it was clear at that moment 
Well, it was somewhat clear because I kept going back and forth to New York. I was a little confused. Um, but it, it seemed clear with my love of raptors, which are birds of prey and actually ravens and pigeons and finches and, um, you know, dogs and foxes. My love of nature, it seemed clear that I needed to be the voice for them. That if I could, if I could show people what I, I saw in nature, they wouldn't destroy it. Now I, Thought this up long before environmental stuff. I mean, I was like, you know, I was just, I was living on an island which Daniela had gone to, as had a number of others. Um, it had, had, was one hour from Manhattan. It, you could only get there by your own boat. There was no electricity and it was a bird preserve. Hmm which by the way meant that it was covered with mosquitoes. Um, but there were marsh hawks and that's Bill's peregrine. <laughs> you're, you're already in the bird room. We are. Yeah, this is, yeah, so. Can I interrupt you for a second? Just sure. so we can talk a little bit about process and what we're looking at. So this room um, with these birds, these are all glass birds, whereas the work that we were looking at previously is all stone. How, did, um, how do you think about the combination of stone and glass and how did you come to incorporate glass into your work? So again, dual nature. Um, and dual nature with light turned out to be a physics term, which who knew? I mean, but in actual fact, my brother and I were very involved with science and very involved with process and the golden mean and the way things form and why they form. And <laughs> Judy Pat, who's a dear friend, brought this guy, Billy Morris, over to my loft in New York. But he knew a great deal and had a team called the um, B Team, I think. And they were these extraordinary young people working with him on glass. And I taught some of them about drawing and Ross Richmond, who's an incredible sculptor, and I do all the glass with, um, he and I became like, like, kind of like the science of light. And I loved the idea that you could acid etch it so that it was like Mirandi's vessels. It was dusty. It wasn't shiny. It wasn't eye candy. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, we lost you. You were just talking about when you cut out, you were talking about how the light on the um, hawks can be otherworldly yeah. and how to capture that, that feeling. Yeah. So there's a thing called synesthesia, which I have, which you hear, you hear shape or you taste form and I hear form and the way the light would go through and touch a hawk in the top of the tree late afternoon, um, it, it had a translucence and a sound that became like both a bird and a monk for me. Something again, which could see in, so that we could see inside of ourselves and we could be reflected outside of ourselves. To have the ability to have that resonance in both ways. And that's gotta really be what physics is about. I mean, 
you know, I love Lila, but I wish she would work on real intelligence rather than artificial intelligence sometimes. <laughs> Lila, because... is, it, Lila is your daughter. Yeah. Hey, Jane. Yeah. Yes. Jane, how long did it take you and Ross to get to a point where you could accomplish these pieces? 20 years. What we do is we have, we used to meet before pandemic times. He'd come down for two weeks and we would work with the team, whether it was Sebastian, who's my other son and a wonderful artist. And um, we figured out ways to do lace or um, Alex Rorig. And we would spend two weeks, we would have these reunions with Kimberly Haw and with Ann Hollingsworth. We would all kind of draw. I would draw for Ross for about a month and they were called the glass blow studies. And so I, we figure out, you know, like I actually want written on my gravestone K161 because it's hell beige, which is my favorite color. <laughs> but you learn all the colors and you do all of these studies for the forms. And then, you know, we would work out how to do layer upon layer and Ross and I would just spend a month preparing and then two weeks working together. And now, um, oh, I'm going to turn so you can see my little girl, May May, in her chair. She <laughs> wants to join the conversation. <laughs> um, and, um, and Ross, Ross and our time together has been an integral part of learning what is possible. Like this is the Peregrine study. Um, Sarah started in on me on how come we never made a Peregrine Falcon. And, and Sarah is a very powerful woman. She did <laughs> not let that go. <laughs> and eventually we started working on drawing after drawing after drawing. And then when it came, it was like, oh my Lord, this is extraordinary, you know? And that's, um, that one's Bill's Peregrine. There's one other Peregrine we started first. Um, but you can see that it's a study. And I think if you're not learning, um, these things don't happen. These things are gifts from an effort made and a failure suffered through. One of the What's things that I love so much about these studies, Jane, um, for me, you know, it teaches me how you think about form. When I see these, this piece is called Heads and Tails, and it's a little bit of an earlier piece, but to see where you've got the, the forms of the falcons, the hawks, the birds of prey, and then you also, on this same drawing, have some horse heads and some dog heads, and you start to see, I start to see these relationships between all of these animal forms and, you know, how the shoulder of the the hawk actually mimics the sort of curvature of the horse's head and the shape of the nose and these wonderful connection points between all of these. And the monk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. there's only probably three forms on the entire planet or the universe, but- What are those? It, well, I don't know, you know, yin and yang and uh, electrons and protons and neutrons neutralizing forces, active forces, passive forces, and it's how we create new life. And when you look at the Fibonacci curve, which is, you know, extraordinary, um, 
you start to see all growth in nature and you know you pull you have, have a piece of clay and you pull a little more and you get a dog you pull a little further you get a fox you pull a, a you know a little further you get a coyote and on the birds the birds are my true love i don't think you could do any of this without feeling immense love for the level of intelligence that could have created this life. And that love and that kindness come, this is the Mars triptych. I started it by laying out colors and watching the way the sun would dry the color I put them outside on the deck and then use a hose and spray them and move the colors so it would move like the way the beach moved. And then at a certain point, I started seeing the eagles, you know, and the birds flying and it's, it's given it. Everything is given as Rodan said, in nature, with an uninterrupted, um, I forget what he said exactly, unimbued um, eternity. I mean, he said that um, everything he did was given in nature. There's a, a quote that I wanted to read. These are, they're just two short quotes. And this is how I draw the birds, okay? So uh, one of my students, can you see that? Here, let me spotlight you for a second and people will be able to see it. How to draw geometric shapes. So I'm gonna just articulate this. So you have, you start with the sort of perfect rendering of an animal, puppy it looks like, and then reduce, reduce, reduce until you get to a simple geometric shape, which is a rectangle or a yeah, circle or rhombus. Reduce. It's yeah. not reduce, Sarah, it's simplify. Simplify. <laughs> I think that that's how I get the bird drawings that I get is that I, I draw, I start out and I needed Robert <laughs> Beverly Hale to, um, teach me Renaissance drawing technique like Leonardo. I needed to learn to draw in that way so that I can draw a realistic peregrine falcon and I can then know it well enough that I can find the essence of that falcon. And that's what those drawings are about. Um, And- It is amazing. I mean, I'm just looking at this drawing that is okay, spotlit so right. I hear my quote. What? Go ahead, James. Okay, so this is from Vincent Van Gogh to his brother Theo. This is 1888. If you study Japanese art, you see a man who is undoubtedly wise, philosophic, and intelligent, who spends his time how? In studying the distance between the earth and the moon? No. In studying the policy of Bismarck? No. He studies a single blade of grass, but this blade of grass leads him to draw every plant and then the seasons, the wide aspects of the countryside, then animals, then the human figure. So he passes his life and life is too short to do the whole. That is so beautiful to me because I feel kind of like that's how I'm passing my life. And then here's your biggest problem. This comes from the Mundaka Upanishads, like two golden birds perched on the self same tree, intimate friends, the ego and the self dwell in the same body, dual nature. The former eats the sweet and sour fruits of the tree of life, while the latter looks on in detachment. So you have to reconcile 
this study of all things and the simplification to their essential nature. And then you have to go after your ego, eating the sweet and sour fruit <laughs> and look on in detachment. Um, that about sums it up. <laughs> I love, uh, Jane, I love the quote you have in your dual nature book as well, the, the first page of the book, it's so beautifully put. The Rilke quote? Right. Or the or in the catalog, the hocus site. Oh, the one in the catalog. Excuse me. Yeah, that's the best quote. Yeah, that's in the whole world. Fantastic. I mean, um, do you want me to read that quote? Yeah, because it's so appropriate to where you are in your life today. You mean like that we're now in our seventies, huh, Bill? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is Hoxai. All I have produced before the age of 70 is not worth taking into account. Yeah. At 73, I have learned a little about the real structure of nature, of animals, plants, trees, birds, fishes, and insects. In consequence, when I am 80, I shall have made still more progress. At 90, I shall penetrate the mystery of things. At 100, I shall certainly have reached a marvelous stage. And when I am 110, everything I do, be it a dot or a line, will be alive. I beg those who live as long as I to see if I do not keep my word. Written at the age of 75 by me, one Hoxai today, Guaco Rojan, Guaco Rojan, the old man mad about drawing. I think that's very cool. Um, and hey, Jane, could you turn your uh, screen around so people could see your studio from a distance? The, the well, somebody could, but I, I'm not sure. Can I? Unplug this. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, then that's a piece of cake. Yeah. So, Jane, this is where you work every day. Yeah. Pretty special. And my friend Judy said, Oh, man, Jane, the Coonan didn't have a studio this cool. <laughs> um, but Yeah, this is where I work every day. And you designed this space. Well, Red, my husband, and John Dixon, and Judy, and I, and Stephanie Lee, and Joshua Hart, and Lila, we all knew what needed to be. And, um, Judy is an amazing builder and artist. It's one of the world's greatest artists. And Judy Pfaff. Yes, Judy Pfaff. And um, she would say, you should use these kind of steps and you could use this kind of glass and these are the garage roll up, you know? And so she, she loves architecture and building. And so I think we've learned a lot, but I was not happy when this happened because I was a relief maker. I used to say I made relief in every possible sense of the word. Like I work on the walls and all of a sudden I have these beams of light coming in through these clear stories and all these windows and you have light all day long except from north light well, you get north light too. So I had to get out onto the floor. And that was a huge um, learning curve for me because that wasn't my loft in New York, which I miss and I love on Green Street. The studio had no windows. Um, and, um, you know, there, there are signs all along the way. Like I went to teach up at 
board. I was going to move back. And I met Donna Tracy, who ran the Hudson Valley Raptor Center. And she rescued, what is Maymay doing? <gasps> Maymay, you've got all three bully sticks. That's mean. <laughs> Uh, May, for those who are not seeing the dog on camera, May May is one of Jane's two dogs who is also something of a kleptomaniac from time to time. Something. She <laughs> steals money. <laughs> They're rescue dogs. Although they, and the rescue lady told me that nobody would take Bookie, her brother, um, and I just wanted May May, and she said, if you don't take Bookie, he's going to end up getting put down. Here's Bookie. <laughs> he's nicely silhouetted there. Yeah. Because <laughs> he got, a, he got a, there he is. That's Buckaroo, the wonder dog. <laughs> and, um, and there's Miss May. And that's May May. They seem uninterested in our Zoom event. Yeah, they're not, they're not interested. But I mean, like, I think an important thing to say is that this has been, a, my life so far has been a team. Like Celia went, for example, to Provence with me and we learned to carve the limestone and we made the pet finders that are in the show there and um and has taught workshops with me and is a superb artist and teacher and as it, you know like this has been a team and Sebastian right now on the team with the stone and the dogs, he says he would take May May in a New York minute. She's the smartest dog he knows. But I don't do this alone. This is a group of people that have kindly and with love participated in um, a great experiment. Like how do you live a life without hurting anybody, conserving nature, having or sharing the love of trees that you Kali adores and, and Edith and her her, her <laughs> videos of May May running up the hill and the light hitting the trees. And we all come to this place of appreciation. And I think it's not, this isn't my work, it's our work. And I think that's an important to talk about. Um, and it's amazing, Jane. Thank you. Sarah, maybe you want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the duration of the show and kind of the uh... Yeah, sure. Yeah, this is actually probably a good point to kind of switch back to inviting people back onto camera. And while everybody's rejoining us. Um, oh, good. I get to see their faces. Yep. Uh, we'll, um, I'll talk a little bit about the duration of the show. I'm going to try and remove Jane from Spotlight so she doesn't have to be huge on screen. <laughs> um, and we can see everybody else. Um, the show is actually up through the month of June. So it's up in this configuration through the end of May. And then we're going to reconfigure the show a little bit um, and shrink it down a little bit. But most of Jane's work will still be. Sarah, yeah. Don't when you reduce it down, don't move Mirandi tail. Move I promise I won't. I'm not going to move that until I have to. <laughs> but it's okay. so beautiful there. Yeah, we won't. We won't move it for sure, Jane. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so it'll be up through the end of June and I would invite anybody who's in town to come in and see it in person because it really, these works are so much better experienced in person than they are online. Although I understand this is as best we can get sometimes, so. Um, I, does anybody have any questions for Jane? I saw one, uh, one question in the chat um, from Antonio. Where did you work in Portugal and with whom? Um, we worked outside. We stayed in Portugal and were driven every morning by, by the Luso American Foundation. Uh, it was Joao, Cristiana, Brasil, Agapito. And that was in the town of Alencar. And then we would also go to Quarry. And these are, um, I mean, these people have been carving stone. Portuguese marble is harder than Italian marble. Portuguese think that it's like a big joke that like the Italians think their marble is so cool. And I think that um, they're right. And the Portuguese marble is, very difficult to carve. And uh, um, Carrara marble is lovely. It, it has, you know, it's, but it doesn't have the soul of the Portuguese marble. <laughs> I don't know where you are. Wait, who asked me the question? I don't see anybody. Antonio see asked and, Antonio, where are you? Uh, I am from Lisbon, Portugal, and um, uh, I am. Uh, I was one of the founders of the Vicars, which is the glass center in, uh, and ceramics uh, in the University of Lisbon. Now I am retired, but I continue to work. <laughs> I was a radio chemist. I visited your studio about ten or more times, and probably um, William Travers. You remember the talks with my wife? No. Yeah, when we arrived, I used to go to see the glass, and uh, William used to talk with my wife a long time <laughs> about <laughs> politics in the world. <laughs> yeah. I want the food behind his head. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we have um, also in our university, PhDs and many people from all over the world. Uh, even Colombia, Iran, China. We had the Russian people there also. <laughs> and, uh, um, it has been a very, a very interesting experience. I can't hear. Thanks, Antonio. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? you want to chime in with or comments for Jane? Okay, if not, I'm going to say um, this is probably a good time to let people go about their, their Saturdays. And I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us today. And Jane, um, a huge thanks to you for sharing your work with us and also just sharing your thoughts about your work and your process. It's, um, it's really enlightening and it makes the work so much more meaningful. So thank you. Thank you. I didn't get to see the pictures of everybody else, though. Okay, well, I'll, I think it'll be in the recording, and I'll make sure you get a list of who all was here. Okay, I want to see. Hi, Jane. Hi. Yeah, we love you. I love Hi, you. Hi, everyone. Have a wonderful Watch Saturday. Everybody. Yeah. Hi, Bye, Jane. Jane. Hi. Thank you. It's Hi. Anne. Hi, Anne. Hi. Hi Anne. <laughs> Have oh, a rest of your Saturday. Beautiful show. Thanks Spell for bye joining. Me. Thanks, Anne. Nice to see you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Have a nice day.